Investors Chronicle. Well, hello out there to all our listeners. This is the IC Companies and Markets podcast for this week. My name is Mark Robinson. I'm filling in for Dan Jones, who is off on a well-deserved break. But I'm not on my own, which is good. I'm joined by my colleagues, Dave Baxter, Julian Hoffman, Chris Ackers, and all under the watchful gaze of our producer, Madeleine Apthorpe. Now, we'll be looking at uh, this week's cover feature shortly. I'll be speaking to Dave about that, and that's uh, Britain's top-rated funds as picked by analysts. Um, This should be interesting uh, for our listeners out there because there are specific recommendations. We obviously can't go over too many of them today, but uh, Dave will be highlighting some trends in the market. After which I'll be speaking to Julian about uh, a specific result for Bankwith Banking, but on a broader note about the state of alternative financing. And lastly, I'll be speaking to to Chris about uh, two drinks companies that uh, target opposite ends of the uh, consumer spectrum, Fever 2 Drinks and AG Bar, both of which released results this week. And there's some similarities there as well as a a few differences. Firstly, I think we'll we'll just have a quick rundown of uh, some of the news stories that uh, are prominent. This morning it emerged that Thames Water uh, could be at risk of uh, being nationalised after uh, it failed to secure a £500 million lifeline that was withheld. And the question there is obviously if if this could be seen as a prelude to a wider debt-related issues in the sector. I mean, we've been warning uh, for some time about the level of leverage uh, in the utility sector generally, and uh, this will get uh, some analysts interested today, no doubt about that at all. This week, there's a few interesting uh, other developments. Uh, Donald Trump's Truth Social site, or the the holding company, went public and uh, attracted uh, about an $8 billion rating, which was slightly annoying in terms of his uh, political adversaries. Uh, those eyebrows obviously raised that at the, the valuation uh, put on, I think it's called Digital World Acquisition, the uh, the holding vehicle, it's a shell company really. Uh, but then again, uh, we shouldn't, you know, we won't be uh, too surprised about uh, the, the ratings given over to tech startups. I mean, you know, It's sort of blue sky stuff, really, for the most part. Uh, There was more solid news, really. Ethical Energy looks like it uh, may become uh, the UK's biggest uh, North Sea oil and gas operator um, after it uh, inked an agreement with Italy's uh, Eni over uh, a few sites there, which is is good news for uh, shareholders, I would imagine. Tom Hayes uh, failed in his legal appeal linked to uh, the libel uh, controversy, over, which was about 10 years ago, I suppose. The appeal was rejected by the Court of Appeal in London and upheld the guilty verdict that was handed to uh, Mr Hayes, who's formerly a uh, Citigroup uh, trader. What was interesting about that, uh, I'm sure as you remember, is that it was a bit of a, it wasn't necessarily a hammer blow, but it didn't do anything for London's reputation in terms of uh, financial probity. The Bank of England has warned uh, of the risk to UK businesses from the private equity bubble. The, again, this is something that's been covered in the magazine in the past. Um, the, you know, the bank average uh, highlighted leverage issues, transparency and valuations. Private equity uh, is bought in heavily into the UK and, and it, just on the supermarket front, you think of Asda and, and Morrison's. Uh, Higher interest rates have already uh, scuppered a lot of investments from private equity over the last 12 months or so. But one gets the impression that uh, the worst of it has yet to play out. Again, it's something that uh, we need to be uh, aware of going forward. Uh, Lastly, uh, Unilever looks like it's going to be um, spinning off its ice cream uh, arm there. There's uh, projections of a, a £13 billion pound listing. Uh, obviously, the uh, board at uh, Unilever probably have had enough of dealing with uh, superannuated hippies 
And so that listing, unfortunately, looks like it could be heading the way of the Amsterdam Stock Exchange, but uh, I don't know if that's been confirmed yet, but uh, it would be bad news for London again. Okay, uh, that's all the news that's fit to print for this week. And so we're going to have a discussion now about this week's uh, cover feature, uh, Britain's top rated funds as picked by analysts. Now, this has been uh, written by Moira O'Neill, who is an old IC stager, one of the UK's most respected uh, personal finance journalists and uh, a noted classicist, if I remember correctly. The um, the feature sets out Best Buy uh, lists from a lot of the main uh, investment platforms, namely A.J. Bell, Barclays, Smart Investor, uh, Best Invest, Charles Stanley, Direct, Hargoves Lansdowne, Interactive Investor and Fidelity. And it also sets out uh, the 14 most uh, recommended funds as well. And I guess it's worth examining whether any trends are evident in the recommendations. It's odd that out of nearly 400 uh, funds, uh, only 63 received two or more recommendations, recommendations rather, uh, leaving a rump of 290-odd uh, uh, funds with only one recommendation each. Uh, you know, the question is whether we should necessarily be uh, surprised on this. You know, mo- most... Uh, Platforms don't agree on 74% of the recommendations, uh, which Moira believes is interesting in itself. But I don't know, I, I'm not quite sure mathematically whether that makes uh, much sense or otherwise. I might uh, bring in Dave now because uh, this is his particular area of expertise. Dave, what are the, what are the, the trends that this, uh, these results seem to, to highlight or are there any trends? Yeah, so there are a few. I mean, as you mentioned, there's a kind of interesting... I suppose, dispersal and difference of opinion among platforms, which might relate to the fact that there are just so many funds out there nowadays. There are thousands available. Um, there are, even though active funds don't always do that well, there are good options. And they may have different methodologies and want to differentiate, differentiate themselves from each other when they're kind of picking interesting funds. So there is that. Um, I suppose in terms of kind of, other trends, obviously, the list is quite, you know, disparate, uh, but we are seeing um, an interesting mix of kind of options. You, you're seeing lots of kind of passive funds are still kind of cropping up there, um, which I suppose kind of reinforces the idea that um, a lot of investors can do well with just kind of a, a source of core exposure from a, um, a tracker of kind of the main markets. Another interesting trend is. Um, I suppose, a kind of absence. So um, Moira sort of did similar analysis about a year ago, and there was a small presence of kind of investment trusts in in the list. But this year, there are no investment trusts. Um, It's kind of hard to tell exactly why that might be. Um, You know, it's quite a difficult period for trusts at the minute. You've seen lots of consolidation, lots of kind of share price weakness and and that kind of thing. Um, So it's quite a disruptive space for investors to be in um but there are still lots of kind of good options that haven't really made it in there though some do appear in sort of separate recommendations the point that you made before that you know i found interesting is is the methodology behind this too because you know conceivably fund managers approach this from a a different perspectives and that that might explain the the apparent uh, disparity of, the, of the, the overall results? Yeah, I mean, I suppose what's interesting is platforms, when they're compiling these lists, will kind of look at some different metrics. So, um, you know, one one metric that has become more important in the wake of the um, kind of Neil Woodford scandal a few years ago is things like liquidity and, you know, whether a fund seems to be managed well in that respect and won't run into kind of problems with illiquid assets. Um, So that's one metric that some might use more than others. Um, And then there are things like consistency of process and kind of performance and how much kind of, yeah, how much emphasis you put on past performance and other metrics. So I guess it's just useful if you're, if you're an investor kind of looking at these lists for inspiration, it's just very useful to actually dig into the lists, um, 
look at what the platforms are prioritizing and then normally with those lists they do kind of have reasonably detailed explanations of their rationale for you know kind of featuring that fund over something else so it it can just help you kind of inform your own initial research there yeah i I guess in a in a sense the as always with investors it helps to ask that go back to first principles what are you hoping to achieve with your investment portfolio uh, yourself and that's going to uh, differ from uh, person to in person so in, in a sense i guess uh, the um, uh, the disparity within uh, that overall research is understandable on that basis did you find that there was any uh, overlap with the the top 50 funds list there is some overlap um, perhaps limited, but there is a bit. So, for example, uh, if you look at the kind of top 14 funds by kind of um, shared appearances in Best Buy lists, there are four names that also feature in our top 50 list. I won't give everything away, but just mention one perhaps. Um, as a fund called BlackRock uh, European Dynamic, that's a very kind of as the name suggests, quite a flexible fund. They're not really wedded to one particular investment style, but they kind of, um, they like kind of undervalued stocks with good growth prospects. And they take quite concentrated, chunky positions as well. Um, so they can, they they got hit really hard in 2022 when that was the big kind of bear market, but generally they've tended to kind of post some quite good returns. And that's been a very kind of uh, solid fund. Um, but yeah, again, I mean, the, the fact that there's still reasonably limited overlap with kind of our list and those lists shows the, I suppose, the point we're making that you can approach these things very differently and there are very different ways to kind of value or prefer a fund. Yeah, I, I guess uh, that time frame element as well is significant. Now, if I go back a few years, and ordinarily, if you had this uh, period as we have where there's been a, a sharp increase and a prolonged increase in interest rates, you might be looking towards the old-fashioned special situations funds as well, but they seem to have gone by the wayside to a certain degree, possibly because we had uh, that uh, that lengthy period of sort of, well, not negative interest rates, but near as damn it. Uh, no. So, you know, th- th- those, type of, um, those type of wider effects as well uh, are often brought to bear. So um, what, what would you be a re- recommendation for our uh, readers and, and listeners for that matter uh, when, when they approach this feature? W- where does it have some value for them? I think it's um, useful for getting some initial ideas. So if you're considering certain regions, then you can kind of look or certain asset classes like bonds. You can look at the funds that are cropping up um, and they might kind of be potential options to research i suppose as a converse approach to that is it might show up some of those funds that are uh potentially kind of crowded trades because you know funds can become too big or too popular um so that can be something to bear in mind as well but it's it's just a good starting point but i think your points about remembering kind of what kind of investor you are what time frames you have, you know, what's your appetite to risk um, and what are you actually looking for? Do you want something simple? Do you just want trackers? Do you want to kind of target specific um, or focus on specific scenarios or markets? Those are all things that you need to bear in mind. Um, And then you can perhaps look through this list and it can just give you some inspiration and it can be perhaps the first step in your own research. And you then need to do much, I suppose, much more diligence on the funds and kind of what fits in with your portfolio. Okay, that's fine. A, a bespoke approach then. Maury's has done a, a great job uh, anyway, and I'm sure it's going to uh, be a particular interest to our readership too, perhaps even more so for those moving away from the traditional 60-40 split. Anyway, thank you, Dave. We're going to move on now to uh, the second topic this week, and uh, it relates to um, uh, results for Vanquist uh, uh, Banking, Uh, formerly uh, Provident Financial, and they were covered by uh, Julian uh, Hoffman. Uh, And uh, I think we can also talk about um, the state of um, alternate financing um, as a a link to this story too. 
So, Julian, could you just explain some of the, the regulatory problems that uh, are facing Vanquish? So it, it, it might help to give a, a potted history of the company as well. Yes, <laughs> Vanquish Bank, uh, uh, everyone's favourite doorstep lender with menaces, allegedly. It used to be Provident Financial, which uh, in its day was um, a halfway respectable higher interest rate lender that was one of those companies that lent to people without credit history or if you'd gone bankrupt you could get some sort of card from them or if you didn't have a bank account they were another one of those that service that you know that section of the market of of which there are unfortunately quite a few uh, people in the UK who don't uh, have access to a bank account it's well over I think two million so quite high so they had this model where they employed lots of uh, self-employed people to collect the money that they were due uh, every month from uh, their customers and they would literally go doorstep to doorstep usually on a Thursday because that's benefits payout day and usually with a baseball bat or was that uh, I I think the baseball bat in this case was optional oh okay uh, as far as I know so yes they had this this doorstep lending model Um, there was some fretting uh, a few years ago that this wasn't any more um, regulatory compliant. Um, although interestingly, the FSA itself at the time, uh, FCA itself at the time, didn't uh, make a lot of comments about it. But they felt that uh, they were not going to be uh, allowed to continue with that that very sort of successful, but uh, quite nice. It's almost like uh, you know early twentieth century model of lending. Um, and uh, so Vanquist has tried, is the successor company to Provident, and that is more like a, um, like a conventional, at least the way that it, it runs its business is more conventional than, than you know, employing people to walk around housing states. Well, presumably with uh, Provident as well, um, that type of model would have been reflected in the, in the net uh, interest rate too. The interest rate they charge is astronomical. If you have a Vanquist card, it can be some any, anywhere up to 70% or okay. APR, um, which I think is relatively generous uh, in that uh, in that space. Um, but yeah, it does offer people who have had credit problems in their lifetime the opportunity of rebuilding their scores or getting back into the onto the ladder. So it's a perfectly uh, legitimate uh, uh, legitimate exercise. But they make um, the, the measure of how profitable this is is that uh, their net interest margin is over 19 percent whereas if you are a conventional bank you'll be lucky even with higher interest rates to make three percent yeah i get i guess conventional banks are struggling enough now uh, but you know partly related to uh, capital uh, constraints or or demands they keep a certain amount of or an increased amount of their capital um it, that that wouldn't necessarily be uh, such an issue for Vanquish, would it? Or, or, or are they suffering on the same basis? They're not suffering from the, the, the capital. Isn't really a you know when you're charging such high percentage rates, your 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 balance sheet reflects risk rather than the cost of funding. Yeah. So um, that service charge they charge a premium for that service because in you know in their view they're taking a much greater risk than a bank would on the same customer okay um so that, that that's how that that model works it, um they're not as regulated you know they're not as tied into how much regulated capital they need to keep on hand and things like that so they, there are certain advantages that uh, a bank has the problem is that they they seem to struggle to maintain their profitability and a lot of that has to do with legacy claims against the business so they've got uh, they do, you know, people are coming forward saying they've been overcharged, uh, you know, X percentage on their loans over the years, and uh, they have to be investigated. Um, the company says that, for the most part, the the cases and are dismissed, but there is a sort of operational cost in dealing with that uh, with that legacy. So they, yeah, so every time the results come around, it's always a case of how many how many. Uh, customers have we had to pay out or deal with this quarter or this or this half and that, that at the moment seems to be what's determining the profitability so the the question really broad the broader question for investors is whether the business as it stands is going to be um viable enough to continue as a 
um, a lending operation in the way it's organized. Um, I mean, the best that the analysts can say about it at the moment is that there was no more bad news coming out as the results, which, you know, as if the best, uh, if that's the best you can say is not a, a ringing endorsement. But, uh, you know, there is a there is an opportunity to recover. I mean, they, they have a, yeah, there is a niche for that service. I mean, it may not, it may not be the one that uh, most people are familiar with, but you know, people do rely on on very high cost credit, and uh, um, if they can get their regulatory act together, then because they're earning such high margins on the capital they need, there is a possibility that they could become more, much more profitable. But uh, we are talking two or three years down the line, I would say. So um, they're also trading at a considerable discount to net assets as well. Do you think that's justified or is it a sign of weakness or a sign of a mispriced asset? Well, it's probably a sign of the weakness of the operating model. If you mean, if you can't, if you can't remain profitable just because a few people are making claims against you, then you have an issue with how businesses run, I would say, which is probably why um, there's that massive discount. But uh, I mean, we're not talking about a situation that's on you know sudden i mean this has been an ongoing problem for several years that uh they've been trying to change their way they operate from from what was a tried and tested model to something which uh, you know it imitates at least in part what other banks do but without really being a conventional bank themselves so you know it's, it's like they've got the the hassle of one the hassle of uh, being a bank, but without the benefits of being. Yeah, a bank. well, I guess you get a situation anyway. With that, it might um, it might as uh, act as a, a barrier to entry in a sense. Uh, but listen, thanks very much for that. I mean, there's not many. I think there are generally not many subprime lenders in the UK. I mean, it's quite a niche market, but it's it's not a, a well served one. So you 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 had briefly you had the the likes of Wonga and this kind of payday lender types. Yeah until they more or less got regulated out of existence. If Bankwest can sort of pull clear of, of its operational issues, then it does have an opportunity to, to dominate the market. So, uh, you know, you've got to, the the, the, que- the key question really for investors, you know, where is the knife, how, how far has the knife fallen? Yeah. And um, are you in a position, would they be in a position to pick up the value when, um, when that, uh, that market dominance comes back, you know? Oh, well, there we have it. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's just, it's just one of those things. It's it's, uh, it, uh, it's 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 a potentially interesting business, but it needs to get out. It just needs to get away from its legacy. Really. It's a vestige of the the subprime era, um, in essence, as well. So, it, it's it, it's certainly an interesting uh, case study. I'm I'm not sure about uh, its investment potential, but uh, we'll come back to it at some point in the future. But thanks thanks very much for that, Julian, and in, no informed view on the company. Lastly, we're going to come to slightly more uh, conventional organisations, two of the UK's uh, prominent uh, beverage uh, producers, Fever Tree Drinks and uh, AG Bar. The former was uh, famous, I guess, because it uh, rode on the back of uh, the premiumization boom, which is a horrible word, uh, no doubt the result of um, marketers. But you know, the, the, the basic uh, story went, uh, they introduced a capital light business model that... Uh, exploits this consumer switch away in favour of high-end spirits. The logic runs that if people are prepared to pay an extra £10 for a bottle of spirits, why wouldn't they pay an extra pound or two for a, uh, a suitable mixer? The other company, of course, AG Bar, is the producer of uh, Iron Brew, who's uh, Scotland's alternative national drink. Um, so on the, on the line, we've got uh, Chris Ackers about this. Chris, um, can we just go to Fever Tree first, uh, if we could? One of the things that I thought that was interesting about uh, the result itself is that the US has become more and more prominent as uh, time has gone on. Yeah, that's right. So the US is now the company's biggest revenue generator after the UK and Europe. US revenue up by over a fifth in the latest year, and the company spoke about the performance being helped by strong off-trade growth, but also some distribution gains in the on-trade. Introduction of products in can formats also seem to go down pretty well with US consumers. And it does seem like there's a lot of potential for future growth in the US. But I suppose looking at the results as a whole, that was the, the good news in terms of revenue. Trading was less impressive across other markets. 
you had flat revenue in the UK, growth of only 4% in Europe, and revenue fell 14% in the, the sort of quite small rest of the world division. I mean, the view we've taken on Fever Tree is definitely enough to keep investors interested um, in, in the investment case. The company is forecasting sort of progress with revenue and margin this year, although we are remaining neutral for valuation reasons, as, as we'll come to in a bit. I remember reading some time ago that uh, the US market is slightly different for Fever Tree drinks in as far as that they're seen as, you know, standalone soft drinks rather, rather than necessarily mixes, which, you know, m- might actually help their expansion over there too. One feature that we we did anticipate uh, was that the, the gro- gross margin was uh, under pressure. Could you explain why that was during the year and uh, whether that's uh, been alleviated to any degree? Yeah, so the, the company's really struggled with inflationary pressures over the last couple of years with higher glass packaging ingredients costs coming alongside higher energy and freight costs as well. And that's all combined to hit margins pretty badly. There is evidence that cost headwinds are now going into reverse. So the margin improved in the second half of the latest year, but overall it was down by 240 basis points to about 32%. And the company is anticipating um, that gross margin will rise by about 6% in the current financial year, which sounds very good. But even if that was to happen, the margin would still be below um, the over 40% level seen in 2021. So it's very much... um, in margin recovery modes at the moment. Yeah, I guess, I guess uh, one of the things that attracted investors initially was the fact that it does have this capital light business model. So its demands on that uh, basis aren't as pronounced as other people in the same space. But of course, you know, that that was shown up to be, um, well, not necessarily um, not the way forward, but uh, the fact when uh, raw material costs started increasing dramatically, uh, particularly in relation to glass manufacture, uh, which is very energy intensive, the the company would, had had to bear those costs as well. So, with sort of uh, the benefits of that capital light mo- model um, are no longer quite so in evidence. So, lo- looking at the rating, uh, we've got them trading at uh, thirty two times uh, forward earnings. Is this uh, uh, realistic given their growth potential, or is it still? a little bit on the uh, the lofty side. Yeah, so I think it's definitely still on, on the lofty side. It's worth mentioning that since the result, they've actually gotten a bit a bit more expensive. So they're now trading at about 36 times forward earnings, which isn't that much cheaper than the five-year average of 43 times. I think this is definitely a hangover from early excitement on the company. And I mean, there are signs of recovery and growth potential, but the valuation is expensive, and that's a key reason why we're staying neutral. For now, there's an, an analyst at Liberum this week pointed out Beaver Tree is trading at a big premium to some other drinks peers like Campari and Remy Quantro. So racing's expensive despite um, signs of recovery. Okay, we'll have to wait round till that comes back to more realistic levels then. We'll just move on quickly now to AG Bar, a company that uh, you're no doubt quite familiar with, uh, Chris. The, their chief or long-standing chief executive, Roger Wyatt, uh, he announced uh, his departure from the group uh, uh, this week as well. Um, or actually, I think it may well have been uh, foreshadowed, that one too. Uh, it was um, a, a decent outing, judging by the sales figures. And um, the, the chairman of the company, uh, Mark Allen, uh, pointed out that uh, under his leadership, Mr. Wyatt turned AG Bar into what was a uh, a small uh, regional player into, uh, I think the quote is, a highly successful multi-beverage branded company. Um, have you got any comments on that as well? You would have, you would have seen that development uh, at close hand, I imagine. Yes, yes. It's, it's worth mentioning that uh, the Rod- Roger White stepping down was announced some time ago, so that wasn't a surprise for yep. investors. But it's obviously a big moment for the company. He's been there for, for a long time. He is leaving behind an impressive legacy, I'd say. So the, the wasted revenue performance, revenue of around 400 million, was 150 million up on pre-pandemic levels. So it's quite impressive growth. Iron Brew is, I mean, remains the, the core product and what the company is known for. But White's has overseen some pretty interesting acquisitions over the last couple of years. And that, that's really expanded the company's product range and he guided the, the business through the pandemic. Um, 
very well. So it's, yeah, it's been an impressive tenure, I'd say. Yeah, I mean, the the product offering itself is uh, uh, developed and uh, that's um, it, it's been certainly successful in terms of the top line these results indicate. But um, there's been some uh, margin pressure as a, as a result of integration issues. Uh, could you set those out, please, Chris? Yeah, so the adjusted uh, operating margin was down by 130 basis points to 12.3% in the latest year. The company pointed to, quote, production insourcing, end quote, on, on the bus, on the boost drinks and Rio acquisitions, um, just, just to, to mention boost was an energy drink acquisition and Rio the tropical drink acquisition. Um, but the margin performance is actually a bit better than the company had anticipated earlier in the year. And it's actually quite bullish about rebuilding margins over the next two years. So I'd, so I'd say sort of short, short term pain when it comes to margin. So, you know, it, it's been it, it's been subject to the same kinds of pressures linked to raw material cost as well, but uh, possibly in a bit of a better position than fever tree. Well, um, thank you very much for that, Chris. And of course, we um, wish Roger White all the best in his retirement. That about uh, wraps it up for this week as well. And I guess I should uh, apologise in retrospect because unfortunately, London is blanketed in a fog of pollen at the moment. That's why my voice has progressively gone more and more towards uh, that of Louis Armstrong. But uh, again, thanks very much for listening. And uh, Dan, we'll be back next week for our next podcast. Thank you very much and goodbye.